Now I call upon the next speaker, the Honorable uh, Dr. M. S. Valiathan, a very well-known international figure, presently National Research Professor and Honorary Advisor, Manipal. Friends, you know Dr. Valiathan as a strong supporter of, admirer of Ayurveda. His work on Charak, Sushrut, and Vagbad is well known to us. His, uh, he will be speaking on basic science approach to Ayurveda. Let us welcome Dr. Valiathan. Madam Jalaja, other distinguished colleagues on the dais and friends, I am greatly honored to be asked to speak here at the plenary session of this fourth World Congress of Ayurveda which has gathered here physicians, scholars, students, and friends of Ayurveda in large numbers. I would like to express my thanks to the organizers for giving me this great honor. Madam Jalaja has given you the big picture of Ayurveda, the existing picture, and what is emerging before us that has made my job a lot easier. I must say that when I, a little semantics, my title is a basic science approach to Ayurveda. Ayurveda is science. So what do I mean by science approach to Ayurveda? I must clarify here, by basic science or science, I mean modern science, like modern biology, immunology, bio-inorganic, chemistry, etc., which date back to the time of the Enlightenment. Before that, they did not exist in the form that we know, mainly associated with the names like Bacon and Harvey and Vesalius, etc. So that clarification is necessary when I talk about modern science approach to Ayurveda. Now, modern science approach to Ayurveda, it became relevant in India only with the East-West encounter, when the Western powers started coming to India. Before that, there was no East-West encounter as far as Ayurveda was concerned. But Ayurveda has a very long history, long before this. Going back to the Vedic times, you heard the chant today, the Ashuni Sukta being chanted this morning. All the Vedas have references to illness, treatment, medications, especially the Atharva Veda. Almost one third of it consisting of hymns, chants about illness, about good health, etc. Now that was followed by a very long phase, almost a thousand years of Buddhist India, where you find all these chants practically disappeared. In the Ayurveda practicing today, we hardly hear any Vedic chants. And this disappearance, the Atharva Vedic chants, hymns disappearing, that is largely a contribution of Buddhist India. When Ayurveda flourished, even though they did not use the word Ayurveda at any time, Takshashila was a great university, where Buddha's physician Jivaka was an alum alumnus of this university. So it flourished, Buddha himself prescribing what we call Ayurvedic medications. Nasya being practiced by Jivaka. So Ayurveda, in fact, the leaders of Ayurveda were Buddhists. Our own Vagpada, who wrote Ashtanga Hridaya, Ashtanga Sangraha, Vagpada was a Buddhist. So they were the great leaders. And then came a few centuries, the golden age of Ayurveda, when the great Samhitas, Charaka, Sushra, the Vagpada, that is the golden age of Ayurveda. This was followed by a long phase of stagnation, where you no longer hear about Charaka or Sushruta, you no longer hear about Takshashila or Nalanda, and that was followed, that was the time the Western power started coming. So it is no more than a moment in the long history of Ayurveda. And the first encounter was the Portuguese coming to India in the 16th century, establishing themselves in Goa, and we are not getting into the politics of, uh, of the colonial administration, but our interest is, along with this Portuguese entry into Goa, there was a most remarkable man, 
Garcia Dorta. He was a Spanish Jew who studied medicine, became a physician, and he came to Goa. And he lived in Goa more than 36 years. And he saw, he observed, and the tropical diseases took thousands of lives. The population in Goa in, from 400,000, in 10 years it reduced to 40,000, mainly because of cholera, dysentery, diseases they are, they are not familiar with. Now, Garcia de Horta, that is where the science looking at Ayurveda begins. He published a most remarkable, some of you may have heard about, but book, Colloquies on the Simples and Drugs of India. There he talks about 57 colloquies, each dealing with a particular medicinal plant, which he saw being used, very good description of the plant, very good description of the diseases which were treated by this plant, the results and so on, all in the form of very interesting dialogues. Now this book created so much interest in Europe, it was translated into many European languages. And this was followed by Van Reed, another remarkable man, the Dutch governor of Cochin. And he again labored for more than 30 years. He was an administrator, a count, a man of nobility. But he collected around him a hundred people, including four plant experts from South Canada and also an Ayurvedic physician from Kerala, Itti Achutan. Now this remarkable group of people, Van Reed identified a Carmelite who could draw very nice pictures of plants. Now this group worked for 30 years, and if you read the Hortus Malabaricus, originally published in Latin in 12 volumes, and translated into English and Malayalam by Manilal in Calicut, who was never honored by the nation, I must say. Now, this Hortus Malabaricus, the pictures even today, they're extraordinarily fine. More than 700 plants, mostly in Kerala, but also coming up all the way to Goa. Now, this was the second in the 17th century. So, whether it was Garcia de Horta or Van Reed, subsequently followed by British scientists like Ainsley, they were all looking at it through the eyes, through the window of plant science. So the first window, science window to look on Ayurveda was plant science, coming on up to the end of the 17th century. And this was followed by 18th, 19th, the search for drugs had begun in Europe, mainly chemically derived drugs. In the 19th century, for example, a very remarkable person, Ehrlich in Germany, syphilis was a big problem in Europe at that time. There was no remedy. And the desperate search, more than 900 experiments before he came up with Salvar San, which was supposed to bring salvation and arsenic preparation. So this chemically derived drugs, the search in uh, Europe, that had an impact here, mainly the approach of pharmacology, that is the next window. And in India, this was taken up by Sir Ramnath Chopra, who started looking at medicinal plants of India. Now, what we call clinical pharmacology today, all that we are doing, really can be traced back to Sir Ramna Chopra, who was in Calcutta School of Tropical Medicine. And he was the one separating compounds, studying the compounds, looking for effects by the bedside, looking for signs of toxicity, and publishing extensively. And his two volumes became the classics in clinical pharmacology. That was the second window, science looking at Ayurveda. And the third followed very quickly, because Ramna Chopra's work on medicinal plants that led to the birth of natural products chemistry in India, where we, be, we became a leader in the world. In the 20th century, sec, the first half, we have such remarkable people like Professor Ashima Chatterjee in Calcutta, Govindachari in Madras. These were all outstanding natural product chemists, organic chemists. And there were literally thousands of papers published from India on medicinal plants, the compounds, purification, isolation, Act, studies of activity and so on. In fact, this you know, enormous database even today is being used by modern researchers, especially by multinational companies, because that gives the basic information. Even Sarpagandha, which we all know, Ravolfia. Ravolfia, incidentally, does not figure in Charaga or Sushruta. It came later to India from somewhere, whether it came from Arab sources, whether it came from China, we do not know. 
but that Ravolfia, the actual studies, the organic chemistry was done by Ashima Chatterjee. So like that, organic chemistry, natural product chemistry, we made, that was the next phase, science looking at Ayurveda. But the second half of the 20th century, the most outstanding development in science was molecular biology, mainly because the human genome was unraveled. We could understand the so-called secret of life, DNA. Now the DNA, it changed our whole perception of life because human beings and a worm, human beings, 30,000 genes, almost 75% we share it with the humble worm. And human beings, 99.9% .9 genes we share. All the differences we have, caste, religion, and color, these all become insignificant when, the, when you look at the biological basis of life. In fact, it is a validation of an old Indian verse from Hitopadesha, I am Nija, Paro Veti, Ganana Lekuchetasa, Udara Charita Namtu, Vasuthaiva Kudumbada. This is mine, this is ours, this is theirs. This is the notion of small minds, but for the broad minded, the whole world is a family. Now, our molecular biology has brought us to the same conclusion. So, there is a major change in our perception itself. Secondly, in a very short period of time, this so called basic science graduated into biotechnology. Nowhere has happened earlier. Bio basic science, if at all it has any application, it may take many, many years before it comes into a technology. But in the case of molecular biology, it was very fast. And biotechnology has already given us, in the field of medicine alone, it has given us large number of products. For example, diagnostic kits with high degree of accuracy. Products which we can use in treatment, human insulin, erythropoietin, growth hormone. These are all products of biotechnology. Or look at new vaccines. DNA vaccines, these are all products of biotechnology. So that is modern biology. Now, naturally, if plant sciences, pharmacology, organic chemistry, all these have looked at Ayurveda through their own windows, now today, it is natural that molecular biology looks at Ayurveda. That is the new window through which Ayurveda is being viewed today.